and as soon as my feet touched Houston airport, I heard the still small voice of the Holy Spirit say, this place will be devastated by floods. I did not know anything about all that, you know. So I just, I was wondering why, what is strange what I am hearing. I began to feel that I am an unlucky person. Every, everywhere that I go, I do not seem to bring a good word of blessing. You know, I try to be a good boy, you know, by trying to make you feel good, God bless you, you will be well, wealthy, healthy, prosperous in all your ways. I tried to do that, no? I could not. I'm sorry. But I was wondering, you know, the moment my feet touched Houston, the Houston soil, or rather the Houston dust, I heard this word. And I, I didn't know what to, Pastor Josephine was beside me, we were walking. I didn't tell this to anybody. I just kept it to myself. And uh, the brother who picked us from the airport, he was driving us to the hotel. And in the conversation, he mentioned about flooding in Houston. I didn't quite clearly hear what they said, you know. Because I was, I was still lost in my thoughts about what, what the Lord said in uh, Costa Mesa, and then what I heard the angels say at the Los Angeles airport, I was just troubled by all that, you know. And uh, when I reached the hotel, I was still pondering those words. What, what does it mean? I will devastate. He didn't use the word destroy. I, I clearly remember the word. God used the word devastate, not destroy. Destroy means make a complete end. Devastate means cause damage. To wake you up to think. To wake you up, it's, devastation is a forerunner to destruction. Before destruction comes, it shakes you up. Come on, wake up. It's a shakening, devastation. So I tried to remember and I googled this morning. Houston flooding. And a whole bunch of articles came up. Then I saw, oh my God, this happened recently, right? In the month of May, when there was a great flooding in the city. And not only that, before this great flooding, the first major great flooding in Houston took place in 1935. That was the first time there was a massive great flooding in Houston, and it devastated. And the news media uses the same word, devastation. So it seems that there is a history of flooding in Houston. And it is an instrument used by God. If you remember that we read in Revelation chapter 14, verse 7, that the judgments of God comes upon the waters and the fountains and the rivers. You know, God removes the boundaries and the waters overflow. They overflow. Even the seas. The Bible says, God puts a command, so much you can come. He puts the boundaries. But if, when God removes the boundaries, then they come rushing into the towns, rushing into the cities, rushing everywhere. Your rivers overflow. About 15 years ago, I was in St. Louis. That was my first visit to St. Louis. And I went up, I mean, after I finished ministering, as I came and sat in the pew, I saw this angel walk towards me. He said, you are not done yet. I want you to give you a word for this nation. So I went up to the pulpit. And this angel told me, tell these people that unless rivers of intercession flows in this nation, like the Mississippi, great destruction will come upon the nation. And this angel I saw 
was the chief prince angel of the United States of America. And I've seen this angel many times in the past, ever since, you know. He stands so huge, right near where the Statue of Liberty is, with a long drawn sword, and he stands guard looking over the whole of North America. He is your chief prince. For protection or for destruction. Either two things can happen. The same chief prince Michael that protects Israel is also the same angel that destroys Israel. God uses his agents, his angels, for a blessing or for judgment. The sins of USA are more than the sins of others. If you read Ezekiel chapter 5, verse 6. My dearly beloved brothers and sisters, the nature of God is like this. Before God judges, he sends his prophets to warn. So many prophets, not only those who are from outside the U.S., even from American prophets, true prophets, not those who just explain away everything. We don't want to hear those prophets. True prophets, God raised them up to warn the nation of judgments. And God also shows signs and wonders in the heavens. A lot of people in the last two years I've heard of shofar being blown in the skies. Have you heard of that? See, strange signs. You know, a shofar is a sound of a warning. It's a sound of a warning. A sound for war. A sound of warning. A sound of get ready. Or a sound of it's going to come. It means many things. Now you have heard people from many parts of the US have reported, they have heard this sound of a trumpet, sound of a shofar being blown from coast to coast. God has spoken to his prophets. God has spoken from the heavens. What more do you want? Two, immutable, unchangeable evidences, voices that God has spoken. But what do we do? Most pastors, most teachers, many, many false prophets, false pastors, false teachers in your great nation, just brush away all that. Oh, no, no, this is not God's judgment. God is a good God. God is that. God is this. You just brush away everything. If you read Acts chapter 12, let me give you an example. Acts chapter 12, verses 1 to 15. Peter was in prison. And the whole church was praying for his release. They did not engage an attorney to fight his case, which we popularly do. The sooner we learn biblical patterns, the greater will be our victory. Rather, the whole church fasted and prayed day and night. A chain prayer was well, done by the church for Peter's release. And God heard his prayer and an angel was sent to set Peter free. Now Peter came out of the prison and he came to where all these believers were congregated. He knocked on the door. So people heard a knock on the door and the servant went and said, who goes there? So Peter said, it is I. And this girl recognized Peter's voice. You will know your own voice, don't you? So she recognized Peter's voice. She was shocked. She ran back in without opening the door. She said, it's Peter. He's there. Now look at how the church reacted. This is the church that was praying day and night for his release. And when a miracle took place, they say, it's not Peter, it's his angel. Don't worry, let's get back to business. So, what did they do? 
they just brush away a supernatural work of God, explaining it away as if it's something natural. What they did then, that's what they do today. Just explain away everything. When an earthquake strikes, the scientists come and they say, oh, the tectonic plates brush against each other. Right? My question is, what causes the tectonic plates to brush? There must be a reason, right? Oh, then they say, oh, the pressure is building up. Okay, good. What causes the pressure to build up? Right? What causes two plates that are so peaceful with each other for such a long time suddenly becomes enemies? <laughs> suddenly, it is a Mike Tyson and an enemy fighting. <laughs> Holyfield and Mike Tyson. And one bites the ear of the other. Nobody forgets that till today, you know. <laughs> right? So what causes the plates to brush against each other? There must be some reasons, right? You know, I have seen, and I have some, another wonderful prophet of God in India who has seen the angels stamping their foot down on the ground, and that causes the shaking of the plates. Nothing happens just by itself. It must be triggered, right? So, before God sends judgment, He warns us. And the Bible tells us in Ezekiel chapter 7, verse 9, when the day of His judgment comes, when He lifts up His hand to judge, He will not spare neither will his eyes show pity. When it is marked for judgment, it is marked for destruction, he will not spare any longer. And what I fear for you very much now is what just happened yesterday, the, high, the Supreme Court judgment. It has thrown open the nation for God to look at her and judge her. You know, I remember hearing from a very, very respectable prophet of God from the U.S. who received a word from God like this. Among the many words that he has received, many things have come to pass. And one word was, the day you see the gays and the lesbians coming out of the closet, that is the day, the last days. It means they are no more hidden. They no more keep their shameful, sinful life a secret. They come out of their closet and they are making an open claim to that. Unashamed. Openly saying, this, this is what? So what? It's good. Right? From small, I had a womanly kind of instincts. So right now, I've decided to change my gender from a male to a female. That made news, right? You know who I'm talking about. That made news, news and waves. Now, look, a celebrity like that, when they come out and make a statement like that, you know, those are the devil's prophets. They are the devil's apostles and the devil's prophets. When they come and make a statement like that, it's like preaching a word, it's okay. Hey, it's okay. An alternate lifestyle is okay. That's the message they are preaching. The gospel they are preaching. And what will happen to all the millions of hits that he or she received? Overnight, he had a million tweets, followers, right? Now, what will all the followers adopt? That lifestyle. You know, yesterday, I had a lunch with a believer in California. 
and he works for the government agency that treats people who have this kind of dubious lifestyles and are homeless people and all that. And he th he's doing a master's degree in psychology. And he told me yesterday that in the state of California, a large number of Christians are adopting dogs, buying dogs, whereas a large number of the gay people are adopting babies. 40,000 so far. 40,000 gay uh, couples have adopted 40,000 babies. Now I want you to imagine like this. 40,000 little babies are brought up by gay couples. What values will those little babies learn? Gay values, right? So you know what is happening in your great nation now? they are preparing the next generation. You are going to become a nation of gays. Where the church will become a small minority, lesser than a remnant. That's what you're going to become. And you're not doing anything about it. You're just hearing and you're walking away. You know, when that uh, Charleston shooting took place, I sat down and I watched the news and I was feeling remorseful, you know. I said, this little, this young boy, 21 years old, just went into this church and he's proud about that. He said, I planned this for a long time to make a statement and not only make a statement, but start up a race war all over the U.S., I was looking at that, and then I called to remembrance that either last year or the year before last, when I was speaking at the conference in Lancaster, the word of the Lord came unto me, there will be communal riots between the blacks and the whites, and how the blacks will be killed, and that will cause racial riots. So I called to remembrance. At that moment, the Lord Jesus walked into my room, came and sat beside me, and he too was watching the news. And then he turned around and asked me a question. Two years ago, I revealed to you that this will happen. What did you do about that? I was shocked. I looked at the Lord. I dropped on my knees. And I fell at his feet. And that day I realized one thing, you know. Not only a revelation should be revealed, but you should pray that it does not come to pass. I was guilty. I repented before God. I said, I'm so sorry, Lord. I repented. And that's when the Lord gave me a message. For such a time as this, what should we do? which I preached at the conference in the Chinese church for such a time as this. When the Lord began using Esther's example, he elaborated to me. A warning was given to Esther. What did she do? She did not walk away. She did something about it. She fasted, she prayed. As a result, the destruction was averted. If the 600 people who heard your prophecy that day had done something about it, prayed that there won't be a racial riots, that killing would not have taken place. That incident in Ferguson would not have taken place. None of the whites killing the blacks would have taken place. The riots in Ferguson, the, the killing in Charleston, would not have taken place. But what are we doing? You know what? Let me tell you honestly, okay? People like you are. See, when I say people like you, please forgive me. I don't mean that I'm better than you. Please don't think like that. Remnant people like you all who go to
to such meetings like this. Good people like you all who do not want to hear sugar coated message. But you know a mistake you make, you hear, you just walk away. You are worse than those who hear a sugar coated message. You are worst. Because you hear, you know. What did you do about it? You heard it. What did you do about it? You stand a greater damnation than those who have not heard. The remnant church must not only hear the prophetic word of God, you must do something about it. You must bend your knees and pray, bind that such a thing must not come to pass. If you do that, then no destruction will come to the shores of your nation. We all stand guilty before God. You know, we have a television network called Angel TV. And the prophecies that I deliver, we make into little fillers and we telecast it 24-7. And our network is also available in the United States. And people are watching, hundreds and thousands of people on, our, on the DTH system, they are watching our channel. They heard it, oh, oh. You know, this is our reaction, oh, oh, period. That's all our reaction is, oh, period. We walk away, we buy our, the CDs, we buy the DVDs, we take down notes, period. What do you do about that for such a time as this? You know, Mordecai told Esther, if you will not do anything about this, you and your household shall be destroyed. You know, if destruction comes, you also suffer, right? When the flooding came, you also suffer. When a typhoon comes, it rooms through, wrecks apart through a nation, you suffer loss, right? The earthquake strikes, you suffer loss. So don't think you'll be spared. Don't think you'll be spared. You must bend your knees. This is what God is now expecting the remnant church to do. Come on, bend your knees. Lift up your hands and cry out. Lord, spare our nation. Spare our nation. Spare our nation. God expects you to cry. Not just hear and walk away. There in Michigan, God showed me George Washington. He said he's still praying for America. He's still praying. Even in heaven, they still pray. You can ask the saints to pray. But they have a job to pray. The reason why? Because we are not praying. Because we are not praying, God has a backup plan. Because he wants to save the people. Ezekiel 22, verse 30 and 31. I looked for a man to stand in the gap, and I found none. So my own arm brought the judgment. So if there was someone who stood in the gap, the arm of God would not have brought judgment, but it would have brought salvation. What have you done? What have you done? For such a time as this, what have you done? When all this talk about same-sex marriage was going on in the nation, what did you do? If you had done something, the Supreme Court would not have passed the law. If you had prayed, Obama would not be in office. And if Obama was not in office, the liberals would not have become judges. You know, 2008, before the elections, I was in Louisiana. 
And after Louisiana, oh, actually, this is my third visit to Houston. I was flying from Baton Rouge to Houston for a meeting for a church. And because of bad weather, the plane circled around Austin for about half an hour to 45 minutes before it came to Houston. And as the plane was circling, I was praying, fasting and praying for the election. This was in 2008. And as I was fasting and praying, I was, my spirit, I was taken up to heaven. And I sat before Abraham and Moses. And I saw that Father Abraham had a file in his hand, a thick file. And on the file, there was written the word USA. And he looked at me and he said, Obama will be elected to office. I said, how can that be, Father? How can that be? I said, what about the, the Republican Party people? They are pro-Christians. I interceded. And he told me, no, it has been decided. It has been decreed by the watchers. Obama will come to office because that's what the people want. I was shocked. This was before, several days before the elections. And nobody among all the Christians, nobody expected Obama to win. And I made this publicly, public in the meeting. The Christians never believed what I said. They came against me. It doesn't matter what, whether you come against me or you don't come against me. It doesn't matter to me. Because he's not my president, you know. Right? He's not mine. I stood before God. I heard from God, and I'm here to tell you what he told me. You know, from the time that I received the word, there were still a few days for the Christians to bend their knees, fast and pray, take hold of God. No, God, we don't want that man. Could have done that. Nobody did anything. This is one thing shocking I find among the Americans. You just simply don't care. This attitude must change. If you want to continue to remain in the righteousness of God, this attitude must change. If not, you will go into captivity. That's the next word the Lord gave me. You will all, even the righteous people will go into captivity. Daniel was a righteous man, but he went into captivity in Babylon. They all went into captivity. They all suffered as slaves in Babylon for 70 long years. Why should you? You have stretched your hands to bless the nations of the world. You have been so liberal to give to the nations of the world. God prospered you and you did not hoard the wealth to yourself. America has been a great giving nation. You have been so generous. You, you bless Israel. But now you are turning against Israel. And you have given to the nations of the world. The church in America have liberally given to missions. You have been so generous. But now you are holding back. You are holding up wealth for yourselves. See, you are turning back from righteousness. Instead of following God, you are turning back, turning your back against God. What are you going to do? Are we going to just sit and allow the gays to rule this nation? You must do something. You can do something. The remaining two years before your next election, you must do something. You must fall on your face. You must take hold of the horns of God. You must cry out to God. Lord, give not the blessings in your nation. Oh, to shame, Lord. You bless this nation. Don't let this nation be put to shame. You should cry out to God. You should take hold of God. This is your destiny. For such a time as this, you are called. What are we going to do? 
Let's stand up for prayer. Now the prophet Jeremiah said, oh, let my head be fountain, be waters, and my eyes a fountain of tears. Let the tears flow that I may weep and pray for the perishing daughters of Jerusalem. Will you weep and pray for your nation? Will you weep and pray? Will you take hold of God? Will you cry unto God that this great nation founded on righteousness, founded on truth, founded on the goodness of God will be spared? Will you cry? Lord, spare our nation, Lord. Spare your heritage. Come on, cry out to God. You beat upon your breast. You let your tears roll. You cry out to God now. You cry out to God now. Your cries, your tears, your intercessions avails much. You cry out to God, Lord, don't turn us over to captivity. Cry for the sins of the land. Cry for the sins of the church. Cry for the sins of your fathers. Cry for the sins of your judges. Cry for the sins of your king. Come on, tear your heart. Tear your heart. And you cry now. You cry. Let your rivers flow. Let your tears flow. Let them flow. Tear your heart. Break your heart. Spare God. Hold back not your tears. Hope <laughs> Cry out, cry out, don't be silent, don't be quiet, cry out, take hold of the horns of God, take hold of the horns of God, and you cry out now, you cry out, let your tears flow.